Incoming chat. Well, I just want to welcome everybody to the first edition of our podcast. And we have a special guest today, Jack Thompson. Jack Thompson is an old friend, first of all, and uh, he's a veteran investment consultant. He's bringing companies to the UK and trying to find investors that they truly believe and want to put money in them. He's a serial entrepreneur. I met um, a few of his companies before, and also he's the founder of Flock, which truly I have no idea what the Flock it is. So I'm going to be asking him that. Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Marcus. So um, let me start by by asking if you, if you can give us a little word of what you've been doing for the last couple of years, so people get a little. So my my life for the last few years has been working um, very closely with um, investors. So these are high net worths. Um, ultra high net worths or representatives of institutional investments um, and ultimately sourcing the right kind of deals for them and connecting them and um, essentially making sure that uh, we find not just funding for companies, so startups, scale ups, but also um, the, the right kind of advice, mentors and, and people who can assist with growing and scaling this, this company up properly. Uh, the, but you're not doing only I mean, English companies, right? You're looking for companies basically around the world. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think if you focus purely on one country, you're going to really limit the, the, the scale of, of, of the operations you can be doing. Um, so yeah, we, we do cast quite a wide net. Obviously working, I mean, I've lived in Poland on and off for the last seven years. Um, and in other countries before then. Um, so I'm very aware of the, the potential um, there is for business in countries such as Poland. Um, so seeing some of the really smart, innovative businesses that have developed here, um, I've really spent the last couple of years trying to draw as much attention to not just Poland, but Central Eastern Europe, um, looking for funding. Because there's a lot going on. I mean, I came to Poland about four years ago and the growth in the tech area, especially, I mean, and, and the creation of new business is yeah. huge. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, particularly fintech, I think internationally did very well. I know in Krakow, they've got a very good fintech hub. Um, obviously, with all investment banks, um, they're looking for as much disruption as they can get as possible. Um, so fintech is, is huge. You know, it, it's, it does have a lifetime on it. It won't go on forever. But even things around medicine, so medtech is, again, very hot. Um, ed tech less so but yeah technology as a whole it, there are so many spheres that there is just this constant need for um, new concepts new ideas new services um, and obviously the, the people the appropriate agencies that can, can fund them and provide the, the necessary advice now, do you believe that is because um, I mean startups they've been around for a few let's say what five eight years mm -hmm. it's been sort of the buzz of the start, uh, startup world or startup scene do you still, or do you think, is, is it a bubble? Is, is this going to finish eventually? I mean, because, and I want to bring it up later, like, mm -hmm. for example, what happened with WeWork. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're, you're kind of right that the, the term startup's been around for, for, say, I mean, certainly in the UK, I think it's been around for sort of nearer to 12, 15 years is when it's sort of people were really honing in on this alongside being a business angel. Um I mean, the, the phrase is, is new. The concept of starting up a business and running it yourself from the ground to, to scaling up to an international level has been around for centuries. Um, it's, a, it's a natural concept. I think one of the issues nowadays is that people focus on having an idea without having any kind of the business strategy behind it. And as a result, they can secure or they try to secure funding or they can successfully secure funding or crowdfund. Um, and ultimately, these, these companies will never fully succeed or will just fail quite, quite quickly because there isn't a lot of business thought going into it. When you go right back <clears throat> 20, 30 years ago, people would set up a business with their own bank account yeah. um, and they would grow it themselves and they'd grow it organically. Then it developed slowly over the years that you can get a cash injection that will help your company to grow a lot faster, I meaning you can get ahead of the competition um, and you can develop more products at a faster pace. Um, nowadays, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who have taken to the new extreme of we don't really have much of an idea. We've got a basic business plan and we just need money in order to actually create it. And I, I, I feel that that is something that could be the bubble. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, at the same time, there, there are people or companies like that. They're just like, hey, we have an idea. We just need money. But there are also investors that they just give them money. Um, and because and you're representing investors' mm -hmm. interests, right? I mean, you... You want to make sure that whoever's investing gets some money back. 
So how do you how do you truly evaluate if if the night is going to burn the money? So number one, working under FCA regulations, I can't provide direct advice to any investor ever. Um, so I can't insure anything. The one thing that I focus on is, for me, there are three key criteria that I look for when I work with a business. Number one is that they've got a sensible valuation. Uh, number two, that they've got evidence of market traction. Um, and that should, again, have a fair ratio to the valuation. So if a company's turning over, say, £250,000 a year and they've valued themselves at £4 million, you can expect with growth that actually, yeah, that's, that's fairly accurate. Um, and the third is that it's a relatively... Uh, I wouldn't say unique idea, um, but an individual idea. I, I don't look for unicorns, don't get me wrong. If I incidentally happen to help fund one, I'd be taking all the credit for it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm working with what I like to consider to be slow burners, something that you'd invest now and in five to seven years' time would exit at 30 times the current valuation You know, at, at, a, at a peak, really. Now, um, going back to, and this, I really wanted to talk the WeWork um, case, because... Mm -hmm. uh, Looking at what Massa did uh, representing SoftBank, he didn't, and he, he said it himself, he didn't really believe in the idea. He believed in the person. He believed in the passion behind mm -hmm. uh, Newman. And what happened? I mean, what happened when, for example, it could be even you, if not investors, they just say, oh, wow, this guy, he has the potential. He has the idea. Let's, let's go for it. I mean, look, the fact is people do business with people that they like and investors invest in people they believe in. And that's a fact. So many of the guys that I work with will take a key criteria that they have a credible, strong, credible team or other very credible advisors and investors on board already. And everything else they believe will just come with it. Um, unfortunately, with that, you do get people masquerading um, themselves as a different style of company or something working in a different industry in order to bump up valuations um, or people who simply they just convince themselves that that's what they are and that's what they do. So due diligence is, is fundamental for any individual. If you're prepared to invest in something without knowing about that business, you're essentially gambling. If you know a bit about the industry um, and you understand what for you makes logical business sense, then an investment is much, the, the risk of that investment is much more contained because you've got knowledge and understanding of it. But just chucking money into a company because people are doing it or because you think the guy's got a nice haircut, you don't expect to get a return. Yeah, no, but, but it happens. I mean, yeah, of course. Especially in this case. Now, uh, looking at the startup scene, right? It started, I'll, I'll guess, it started in the US as the new way to create tech business mm -hmm. specifically. And they started moving to Europe and now Central and Eastern Europe, they're picking up a bit late, but they're picking up a lot into the startup world in this way too. I mean, there are events everywhere, there are communities and everybody talks about the the like the new scene or like we're the new Silicon Valley of Europe. And mm -hmm. how do you see this developing in this side? I mean, things are pretty much sorted in the US. I mean, the UK is sort of the same case, but What's happening here? What, or what, how you see it happening here? How you so, see it growing here? So one thing that I'll say that's probably fairly controversial, um, especially with the guys I work with in the UK, is that um, we are inundated in the UK, and I think America are inundated with very samey companies. They're sort of like a Revolut 2.0, and, and there's a lot of them floating around. They've sort of made a slightly better or slightly different version of something that already exists. Um, in Poland, what I've experienced is that you've got guys who've set up a company, they've gone out, they've started to generate a revenue, get it up to a certain size, and you know, to reference what I discussed earlier about the initial definition of a startup, then they source funding. These companies are much more appealing, because, to, certainly to my investors, because they've got a proven track record in what they're doing. Um, the one thing that probably hinders them at present is that Central Eastern Europe is still not recognized internationally as a strong business stage or arena to be doing any kind of any kind of work. It will happen in time. In the seven years that I've been working here, um, I've seen so much develop, so much grow. Um, not just, And I don't mean sort of specifically to startups, but um, large corporations, they've suddenly popped up from all over. I mean, when I first came here, the big four weren't even here. They weren't to be seen. And now you've, you've got them all here um, in and around Wrocław. The number of office blocks popping up, is, you know, it's growing year on year. Um, and the main reason for that is, 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 okay, Poland in general, but Wrocław as a city is the perfect talent pool for young, smart, hardworking people who speak at least one or two other languages 
these guys get business, they understand efficiency, uh, and they work hard, and that's it. It, it. If you've got those basic criteria and you chuck in a bit of innovation, you've got yourself the makings of a startup. A lot of other countries um, that have become complacent, and I don't want to start naming names, but let's take the UK as an example. Because funding and advice is so easily accessible by comparison to how it is in Central Eastern Europe, people are creating an idea that they, they consider it like a legacy company. They've not even contemplated how that company is going to exit, what the value is going to be for the investor, what potential returns they can be offering, what the revenue should be, what they should be forecasting. Um, they've just got a cool idea that they can set up and it will make decent money. Um, and that's sort of as far as it goes. Poland, the, the startup scene seems to be much more focused on how can we scale this and how can we ultimately exit from what we've got now. I, mean, I guess they're learning from the mistakes from the other countries or the previous startups and how... I, I think my perfect re reference to this, I don't know how much I can name drop, but McDonald's, um, if you look at McDonald's in the UK and in America, they're pretty crappy places. Like, they're not great. You wouldn't take the family there, like... Okay, you would take that. That's not true. You would take the family there, but you wouldn't um, be particularly happy. You, you to wouldn't take the girlfriend. There. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, you shouldn't take the girlfriend anyway. But, um, but no. The the point is when you look at countries, and I don't just mean in Poland, but even when I lived in Portugal, for example, or um, in in Madrid, um, the the standard of uh, every single McDonald's was was so high because they'd all been developed so much later on than they were in the UK and in America. They weren't. They're still a fast food chain, but it was like they're, they're clean. Everything is the touchscreen pads. They're efficient. Um, I mean, the food is all the same because it's just generically made. But there's still like this degree of pride behind the brand in these countries. When you look at countries like America and and uh, again in in the UK, um, they they really struggle. The, the the market share in fast food for companies like McDonald's really struggle. Because there are so many better, slightly more ex slightly more expensive versions of them that have been created off the back of them, um, and it's the same with business here, uh, startups here. Sorry, they've seen all the mistakes, all the errors, or they've heard all the stories. They've got yeah. to hear, hear these, these these facts, and they've said, "Well, we can do that, but we can do it better, and we can do it faster, and we can probably do it cheaper, or we can definitely do it cheaper." Uh, and so they do it, and but the issue still is connecting the external funds, the external advice to Central Eastern Europe, because the moment that happens is when there will be an, an explosion um, in terms of the business that would come in and out of Poland. Um, or and, Poland. It, and it seems that the whole Europe has been pushing um, not just their own countries, but the, also seen, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. It, it feels like Germany and Italy and France, and they're all pushing also this area of Europe to. Mm -hmm. To get better and faster and, and bigger, but um, what happens now with Brexit? And I mean, I know you, I know you get <laughs> oh, this question a lot. <laughs> um, but um, do you do you think it's going to really affect the, the 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 ecosystem? Or I mean, yes and no. The one thing I've noticed is that there's a churn. Um, so there's a movement from. I work a lot with um, companies that. Uh, obviously I work with startups but I also work with things around debt and debenture um, so property opportunities and what, what I found is that you've got guys who would originally only invest in property and now considering looking at the tax relief schemes around startup investments um, people who were again predominantly focused on tax relief schemes in, in startup investments are now looking more towards property people who are investing inside the UK only are now contemplating well maybe we should get some skin in the game outside of the UK uh, and similarly those who have predominantly invested outside of the UK historically are now saying well hang on a second we don't have anything that we've invested in in the UK we're not sure what the landscape's going to be we need to start investing back in the UK so From what I've seen, from the guys I work with, and there's quite a lot of investors, there there isn't a, an over. If you look at it as a as a as a total, there isn't an overall um, shift, but there is a churn. There's a movement of preferences, etc. Et at, yeah. at the moment, so there's no there's not going to be Armageddon for a startup. So it's just no, I don't think so. And I wouldn't. <laughs> and, I, and to be honest, I mean, the UK leaving, you've still got countries like Germany. Um, or you've got, uh, you know, th there's so many things um, just focused in and around Europe. It may strengthen it or it should or could strengthen 
uh, the ecosystem across mainland Europe. Um, within the UK, I, I, again, I, I don't think there would be a factor because people work with, um, you know, we work with investors in, or VCs in Singapore um, or all across okay. Asia. So it's the, the, the funds come from, from, from all different directions. Right. The m money is still there. Money, yeah, money is everywhere. The one thing I always say to people is if you ever need money, I can find you money. It's not a problem. It's good um, to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've been getting money for companies growing up. Now you're growing your own company, which I have to say, again, because I've seen you, and I'm, I'm not going to say I've seen you failing many times, but even I though I, even though I've seen <laughs> that. But I mean, most of the time you, you get to leave a company when you're happy and when you just want to start something else. And now yeah. you're starting Flock. And like I said in the beginning, I have no idea what flock is. So okay. once again, what the flock? So um, this is probably a good time to make a general announcement to you anyway. I, after seven years being here, I'm actually, uh, I've moved back. To, well, I'm, I'm moving back to London tomorrow, finally. Oh, wow. Um, so I, I've been back and forth. The last six weeks, um, I made a decision to, to relocate to London, which is when flock was born. Um, And with uh, a few colleagues of mine based in London, we are um, ultimately um, looking to connect um, socially responsible, sustainable focused businesses with high net worths, ultra high net worths. Um, our one big focus with a lot of the guys I work with, the investors, they, they've worked in the city their whole life and they've now had families who now have young families themselves. And they're very aware of the fact that perhaps they've not done very much to help the environment or help the future or help future generations. Sure, right? So their focus now is, you know, we want to focus a bit on sustainability. So that for me was a, a, an immediate trigger. The second thing is, you know, as, as much of a priority is that we look after the environment, um, it makes good business sense. I've said all along, sustainability is one of the best things to invest in because you're investing in the future. So if you want the future to be here, then you invest in something that's going to ensure yeah. that happens. Therefore, your investment will be there as well. Again, it's my opinion. I, I can't give advice to people on what they should and shouldn't be doing, but I listen to my investors. And my focus is that if we can do something that ultimately will clean up the oceans and assist with the, the future um, growth and, and development of the world um, and basically ensure that we, we stick around for as long as possible, then I want to be involved because, uh, uh, you know, the current rate, if we don't start doing something, I certainly wouldn't want to have children. I wouldn't want to bring generations up, future generations well, up. I, I get it. I, ha I have kids. So it's, I, yeah. it's, it's, it's important and it's, it's very noble. But, but do you see money moving around in that area? Do you yeah. See? I mean, they're, they're, uh, so from a, let's look at it in two, two parts. From a business standpoint, yeah, there is a lot of money moving around because you're rarely going to meet somebody who says, Oh, I don't care about the environment. And you do. I've spoken to one person in the last month who said, like, oh, I couldn't care less. <laughs> I'm um, going to die anyway. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, their, their focus is if it's a good business opportunity. The fact is, investing in things around sustainability makes perfect sense. Having said that, I, you know, I work with some companies who are purely non-for-profit. They are creating these legacy things that we talked about before. But being involved in that is more like your corporate social responsibility. You're just sort of ticking a box and you can do that because you think it's a good cause and, and you believe in, in what it's doing. But ultimately, uh, just to before we get on to the, the, the second side of it, investors are business people. So it doesn't matter how much someone harps on about how we need to save the planet and we need to do this, this and this or look after old people or, or um, I don't know, find be find more efficient ways of creating energy they're going to want to know how much money they're going to get back from their investment yeah. and when they're going to get it. Um, so that's where the business aspect is very important. So yeah, certainly there's a lot of money being shifted around and the longevity of that investment um, is, is very important. As I said, you're investing in the future. Therefore, if, if you invest in products that are going to ensure the future goes on for as long as possible, essentially, then, then your investment should be as safe as long as possible. Um, the other aspect of it is the environment, and this is something that's very close to me. I, I've, I've always wanted to, to look to, to do the best thing um, and to, to you know, I, I, I like to look after people. I want to make sure that everything, uh, everyone has a fighting chance in what they do. I believe in people having second, third, fourth, fifth chances in life. Um, because life is too short for any kind of conflict around that. If you can do things 
um, that can benefit people, be it homeless people, be it families struggling because they're on that they're relying on social provisions, um, or more importantly to me, um, animals and wildlife and things like that. I, I think that speaking for people that don't, or people, sorry, speaking for um, a, 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 a group that doesn't have a voice um, is important. It, it's so important. Um, so many campaigns now, people saying, don't buy a dog, go to a shelter. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and it's true we, that there are so many things that kind of get swept under the carpet and you, that there are more and more activists getting involved now and it's great. Um, the one thing for me really is that people always say that capitalism and socialism are two very separate things or they always address them separately now i'm not a capitalist and i'm certainly not a socialist either but i believe in being a good person and i believe that you can be a good person and make a good return on any investment at the same so time so you get the base of both worlds it's easy to make money as an arsehole you can you can do anything if you, you I'm, I'm sure we know if you yeah you, but 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 there are ways to to, to do things that are immoral or illegal to make money it's very easy um but if you can do something that's really going to make a difference and you can be passionate about it and one day when you're on your deathbed think i really made an impact there or i left a footprint on the on the planet and not a carbon one uh then i, I think that's what investing should be about you, you know you make them the, the good business from it but ultimately it's it's the legacy you leave behind with it yeah as well. and if, if you're keeping people happy getting the return but at the same time they're, they're helping mm -hmm. or they're doing something that matters that's i mean that's very noble and it's a great idea for flug i mean it, i think is and i hope as well that it gets a really really good future yeah i mean we've got some really exciting projects we're working with now um it's yeah it, it takes time we one thing that i i really don't believe in ever is rushing anything um, and it's about quality it's about connecting the right investors or the right institutions with startups mm -hmm. or with property developments or whatever um I, I, of course we take a fee when we close the deals um but it's a, it's a company after all you, you have to again you, you make money from doing the the, the job um but uh that's not we're not in a, in a in a rush to push people into things we manage our investors we manage the relationships with them we spend long periods of time with them chatting working out exactly what they like um, and then sourcing what we consider to be the most appropriate deals but we're a middleman we don't provide the advice we don't follow up on things if, if they don't particularly like a deal we, the connections yeah we, we say to the entrepreneur that they're, then they're not interested unfortunately we glean what the feedback was that so we can share it with the entrepreneur or the, or the sme um, and then we also take that feedback ourselves so that we know that the next deal we find can be more appropriate and more fitting for them. That sounds awesome. Um, I, I don't want to cut it because I, I, I know we can keep talking for I know, ages. sorry, I'll, I'll go to, like I said, you'll turn <laughs> yeah, the yeah, lights no, off. Absolutely. But um, I'll make sure we, we have a second part of this and we're probably sure. going to come and visit you in the UK when Fluck is... I'll fly you over. Up and running. Yeah, yeah, awesome. <laughs> And well, thank you one more time for coming, man. It was a pleasure. It was great thank catching up. Me. And um, thank you for everybody listening and watching. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We really want to hear from you. So make sure you leave a comment in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time. Incoming chat.